the little bell. Takazo lay among the corpses. There were thousands of them. The whole world gone crazy, he thought dimly. A man might as well be a dead leaf floating in the autumn breeze. He himself looked like one of the lifeless bodies surrounding him. He tried to raise his head, but could only lift it a few inches from the ground. He couldn't remember ever feeling so weak. How long have I been here? He wondered. Flies came buzzing around his head. He wanted to brush them away, but he couldn't even muster the energy to raise his arm. It was stiff, almost brittle like the rest of his body. I must have been out for quite a while, he thought, wiggling one finger at a time. Little did he know he was wounded with two bullets lodged firmly in his thigh. Low, dark crowd shifted ominously across the sky. The night before, sometime between midnight and dawn, a blinding rain had drenched the plain. It was now past noon on the 15th of the ninth month of 1600. Though the typhoon had passed, now and then fresh torrents of rain would have fallen on the corpse and on to Takazo unturned face. Each turn it came, it opened and closed his mouth like a fish trying to drink in the droplets. It's like the water they wipe a dying man's lip with, he reflected, savoring each bit of moisture. His head was numb, his thoughts the fleeting shadows of delirium. His side had lost, he knew that much. Kawa Kalawa Hidakai, supposedly an ally, had been secretly in league with the Eastern Army, and when he turned on Ishida Mitsunari troops at the twilight, the tide of the battle turned too. Then he attacked the armies of the other commanders, and the collapse of the Western Army was complete. In only a day's fighting, the question of who would henceforth rule the country was settled. It was Tobaganaga the powerful Edo Daimyo, the image of his father and the old villagers floated before his eyes. I'm dying, he thought without a tinge of sadness. Is this what it's really like? He felt drawn to the peace of death, like a child memorized by a flame. Suddenly, one of the nearby corpses raised its head. Takazo! The images of his mind cease. As if it wakened from the dead, he turned his head towards the sound. The voice he was sure was that it was his best friend. With all his strength, he raised himself slightly, squeezing out a whisper, barely audible above the pelting rain. Mahachi, is that you? Then he collapsed and lay still and listened. Takazo, are you really alive? Yes. I'm alive, he shouted in a center of burst of Barado. And you, you better not die either. Don't you dare. His eyes were wide open, and now a smile played faintly about his lips. Not me, no sir. Gasping for breath, crawling on his elbows, and dragging his legs stiffly behind him. My Hachi inched his way towards his friend. He made a grab for Takuzo's hand, but only caught his small finger with his own. As childhood friends, they often seal promises with this gesture. He came closer and gripped the whole hand. I can't believe you're all right too. We must be the only survivors. Don't speak too soon. I haven't tried to get up yet. I'll help you. Let's get out of here. Suddenly, Takazo pulled Mahachi to the ground and Gralo played dead. More trouble coming. The ground began to rumble like a cauldron. Peeking through their arms, they watched the approaching whirlwind close in on them. Then they were nearer, lines of jet black horsemen hurling directly towards them. The bastards, they're back, exclaimed Manhachi, raising his knee as if he's prepared for a sprint. Takazo seized his ankle, nearly breaking it, and yanked them to the ground. In a moment, the horses were flying past them. Hundreds of muddy, lethal hooves gaveling in a formation 
riding rough shot over the fallen samurai. Battle cries on their lips, their armors and weapons clinking and clanking. The riders came on and on. Mahachi lay on his stomach, eyes closed, hoping against hope that they not be trampled, but Takazo stared unblinkingly upward. The horses passed so close they could smell their sweat. Then it was over. Miraculously, they were uninjured and undetected, and for several minutes both remained in silent in disbelief. Save again, exclaimed Takazo, reaching his hand out to Mahachi, still hugging the ground. Mahachi slowly turned his head to show a broad, slightly trembling grin. Somebody's on our side, that's for sure, he said huskily. The two friends helped each other with great difficulty to their feet. Slowly, they made their way across the battlefield to safety of the wooden hills, hobbling around the arms around each other, each other's shoulders. There, there they should collapse. But after a rest, foraging for food, for two days, they subsisted on wild chestnuts and edible leaves in the sodden hollows in Mount Ibuki. This kept them from starving, but Takazo's stomach ached, and Mahachi bowels tormented him. No food could fulfill him, no drink quench his thirst, but even he felt his strength returning bit by bit. The storm on the 15th marked the end of the fall typhoons. Now, only two nights later, a cold white moon glared grimly down on the cloudless from the cloudless sky. They both knew how dangerous it was to be on the road in the glaring moonlight, their shadows looming like a silhouette targets in the clear view of any patrol searching for stragglers. The decision to risk it had been Takazo, with Mahachi in such misery saying he'd rather be captured than continue trying to rock. They really didn't seem to have much choice. They had to move on. But it was also clear that they had to find a place to lie low and rest. They made their way slowly in what they thought was the direction of a small town of Tori. Can you make it? Takugo asked repeatedly. He held his friend's arm around his own shoulder to help him along. Are you alright? It was later breathing that worried him. You want to rest? I'm alright. Mahachi tried to sound brave, but his face was pallid than the move above them, even with the lance for a walking stick. He could barely put one foot in front of the other. He been apologizing objectively over and over. I'm sorry, Takazo. I know it's me who slows us down. I'm really sorry. The first time Takazo has simply brushed this off, for, well, forget it. Eventually, when they stopped to rest, he turned to his friend and burst out. Look, I'm the one who should be apologizing. I'm the one who got you into this this in the first place, remember? Remember how I told you my plan, how I was finally going to do something that really would have impressed my father. I have never been able to stand the fact that to this dying day he was sure I never amount to anything. I was going to show him. <laughs> Takazo father has once served under Lord Shimon of Iga. As soon as Takazo heard that Ishida Misuri was raising an army, he convinced that the chance of a lifetime has finally arrived. His father had been a samurai. Was it only natural that he would be made one too? He arched to enter the fray to prove his mettle. To have the word spread like wildfire through the village, that he had decapitated an enemy general. He wanted desperately to prove he was a somebody to be reckoned with and to be respected, and not just the village troublemaker. Takazo reminded Mahachi of all of this, and Mahachi nodded. I know, I know, but I felt the same way. It wasn't just you. Takazo went on. I wanted to come with I wanted you to come with me because we always sent everything together. Didn't your mother carry on something awful, yelling and telling everybody I was crazy and no good? And your fanatse, Otsu, and my sister, everybody was crying, saying the village boys should stay in the village, or maybe they have reasons. 
we both only sons, and if we get ourselves killed, there's no one else to carry on the family's names. Who cares? Is that any way to live? They had slipped out the village unnoticed, and convinced that no further barrier between themselves and the honor of battle. When they reached the Shimon encampment, however, they came face to face with the realities of war. They were told straight away they will not be made samurai, not overnight, nor even a few weeks, no matter who their fathers had been. To Ishida and the other generals, Takazo and Mahachi were a pair of country bumpkins, little more than children who happened to have got their hands on a couple of lances. The best they could have wiggled was to allow to stay as common foot soldiers. Their responsibilities, if they could be called that, consisted of carrying weapons, rice kettles and other utensils, cutting grass, working on the road, games, and occasionally going out as scouts. Samurai! Ha! said Takazo. What a joke! General said, I didn't even get near an enemy samurai, let alone a general. Well, at least it was all over now. Now, are we going to do? I can't leave you here all alone. If I did, I could never face your mother, mother or Otsu again. Takazo, I don't blame you for the mess we're in. It wasn't your fault we lost. If anybody's to blame is that two-faced Kobayakawa. I really like to get my hands on him. I'll kill the son of a bitch. A couple of hours later, they were standing on the edge of a small plain, gazing out over a sea of reed-like mitsukas, battered and broken by the storm, no houses, no lights. There were a lot of corpses here too, lying just as they had fallen. The head of one rested in some tall grass, another was on its back in a small stream, still another was entangled grotesquely with a dead horse. The rain had washed the blood away. In the moonlight, the dead flesh looked like fish scales. All around them, a lonely autumn litany of bell rings and crickets. A stream of tears cleared a white path down Mahachi Grimmy's face. He heaved the sigh of a very sick man. Takazo, if I die, will you take care of Otsu? What are you talking about? I feel like I'm dying. Takazo snap. Well, if that's the way you feel, you probably will. He was exasperated, wishing his friend were stronger so he could lean on him once in a while. Not physically, but for encouragement. Call him Mahachi. Don't be such a crybaby. My mother has people to look after her, but Otsu all alone in the world. Always had been. I feel sorry for her, Takazo. Promise you take care of her if I'm not around. Get a hold of yourself. People don't die from diarrhea. Sooner or later, we're gonna find a house, and we're, and when we do, I put you to bed and get some medicine for you. Now stop all this blubbering and about dying. A little further on, they came across a place where the pile of lifeless bodies made it, as a whole division has been wiped out. By this time, were callous to the sight of gore. Their glazed eyes took in the scene with cold indifference, and they stepped to the rest again. While they were catching their breath, they heard something about something move among the corpses. Both of them shrank back in fright, instinctively crouching down with their eyes peeled and senses alert. The figure made a quick, darting movement, like of a surprised rabbit. As their eyes focused, they saw whoever it was squatting close to the ground, thinking at first it was a stray samurai. They braced themselves for a dangerous encounter, but to their amazement, the fierce warrior, out to be a, a young girl. She seemed to be about 13 or 14 and wore a kimono with no round sleeves, the narrow obi around her race, though patched in places was a gold code. There among the corpses she presented a bizarre sight in, indeed. She looked over and stared at them suspiciously with shrewd cat-like eyes. Takazo and Mahachi were like both wondering the same thing. What on earth could could bring a young girl to a ghost ridden corpse strewn field in the dead of night? For a time they both simply stared back at her. Then Takazo said, Who are you? 
She blinked a couple of times, got to her feet, and sped away. Stop! Shouted Takazo. I just wanted to ask you a question. Don't go. But she was gone, like a flash of lightning in the night. The sound of a small bell receded eerily into the darkness. Could it have been a ghost? Takazo amused aloud as he stared vacantly into the thin mist. Mahachi shivered and forced a laugh. If there were any ghosts around here, I think they be those soldiers, don't you? I wish I hadn't scared her away, said Takazo. There got to be a village around here somewhere. She could have given us any directions. They went on the climb nearer the two hills ahead of them, and the howl on the other side was a marsh stretched out south from Mount Fua, and a light only half a mile. When they approached the farmhouse, they got the impression that it wasn't the run of the mill variety. For one thing, it was surrounded by a thick dirt wall. For another, it a gate verge on being grandiose. Or at the least, remains of the gate, for it was old and badly in need of repair. Takazo went up to the door and rapped lightly, Is anybody home? Getting no answer, he tried again. Sorry to bother you at this hour, but my friend is here, sick. We don't want you to call. We don't want to cause any trouble. He just needs some rest. They heard some whimpering inside, and presently, the sound of someone coming to the door. You're the stragglers, aren't you? The voice belonged to the young girl. That's right, said Takazo. We're under Lord Shima of Iga. Go away. If you found your way around here, we'll be in trouble. Look, we're very sorry to bother you. You like this, but we've been walking a long time. My friend needs some rest and all, and please, go away. All right, if you really want us to go. But couldn't you give my friend some medicine? His stomach is in bad shape. It's hard for us to keep moving. Well, I don't know. After a moment or two, they heard footsteps and a little tinkling sound receding into the house, growing fainter and fainter. And just they noticed the face, it was the side window, a woman's face. It was like, Akimi, she called out. Let them in, they're foot soldier. The Koga patrols aren't going to be wasting your time on them. They're nobodies. Akimi opened the door and the woman who introduced her to Oka and listened to Takuzo's story. It was agreed that they could have they could have the witch said to sleep in to quiet his bowels. Manachi was giving a manoli of car charcoal powder and thin rice gruel with scallions in it. Over the next few days, he slept with almost without interruption, while Takazo, sending an individual by his side, used cheap spears to treat the bullet wounds in his thigh. One evening, about a week later, Takazo and Manachi sat chatting. There must have been some kind of trade, Takazo remarked. I couldn't care less what they do. I'm just glad they took us in. But Takazo's curiosity was aroused. The mother, not so old, he went on. It's strange, the two of them living alone here in the mountains. Um, don't you think the girl looks a little like Otsu? There's something about her that puts me in mind of Otsu, but I don't think they really look alike. They're both nice looking, that's about it. What do you suppose she was doing the first time we saw her creeping around those corpses in the middle of the night? It didn't seem to bother her at all. Huh. I could see, still see that her face was calm and serene as those dolls they make in Kyoto. What a picture. Maachi motioned for him to be quiet. Shh. I heard the bell. I came in a lot. Light on the knock of the door sounded like tape being on a wood paper. Mahachi, Takazo, she called softly. Yes, it's me. Takazo got up and did the lock. She came in carrying a tray of medicine and food and asked them how they were. Much better, thanks to you and your mother. Mother said that even if you feel better, you shouldn't talk too loud or go outside. Takazo sp spoke for the two of them. We're really sorry to put you in so much trouble. Oh, that's okay. You just have to be careful. I Ishida Mitsurinari, some of the other generals haven't been caught yet. 
They're keeping close on Mosh on this area, and the roads are crawling with Togara troops. They are. So, even though you're only foot soldiers, Mother said if we were caught hiding you, we'll be arrested. We won't make a sound, Takazo promised. I'll even cover Monetary's face with a rag if he snores too loudly. Akimi smiled and turned to go and said, Good night, I'll see you in the morning. Wait, said Mahachi, why don't you hang around and talk a while? I can't. Why not? Mother be angry. Why? Worry about her. How old are you? Sixteen. Small for your age, aren't you? Thanks for telling me. Where's your father? I don't have one anymore. I'm s sorry. Then how do you live? We make moksa. That medicine you burn on your skin will get rid of the pain. Yes, moksa from the hereabouts is famous. In the spring, we cut the monk wart on Mount Abiki. In the summer, we dry it. In fall and winter, we make it into a moksa. We sell in Tari. People came from all over just to buy it. I guess. Don't you need a man around to do that? Well, if that's all you wanted to know, I better be going. Hold on. Just another second, said Takazo. I have one more question. Well, the other night, the night we came around, came here, we saw a girl on the battlefield and she looked just like you. That was you, wasn't it? Akim quick, turned quickly and opened the door. What were you doing out there? So he slammed the door behind her as she ran to the house. The little bell rang in a strange, erratic rhythm. The comb. At five foot, at five eight or five nine, Takazo was tall for the people of his time. His body was like fine steed, strong and supple, with long, sinewy limbs. His lips were full and crimson. His thick black eyebrows fell short of being bushy, but by the virtue of their fine shape, extending well beyond the outer corners of his eyes, they served to assume his manly his manliness. The village called him the child of the fat year, an expression used only about children whose features are larger than average, far from an insult. The nickname nonetheless set him apart from the other youngsters. And for this reason, it caused him to consider an embarrassment in his early years. Although it was never used in reference to Mahachi, the same expression could apply to him as well. Somewhat shorter and stockier than Takazo, he was barrel trusted, round face, giving an impression of a jo of joality, if not downright buffoonery. His prominent, slightly protruding eyes were given shift was given to, given to shifting when he was talking, and most strokes made that expense hinge on the observance to the frogs and the croak unceasingly through the summer nights. But both youths were at the height of their growing years, and thus quick to recover from most ailments. By the time Takazo's wounds were completely healed, Manachi could no longer stand his incarceration. He took pacing the woodshed, complaining endlessly about being cooped up. More than once, he made a mistake of saying he felt like a cricket in a damp, dark hole, leaving himself wide open to Takazo's retort that frogs and crickets are supposed to be Supposed to be such, supposed to be like such living arrangements. At some point, Mahachi had begun pe peeping into the house because one day he leaned to his cellmate as if to impart some earth shattering news. Every evening, he whispered gravely, the widow puts the powder on her face and pretty herself up. Takuzo's face became that, that of a girl hating a trivial, detecting, te detecting defection. A budding interest in them, in his closest friend Mahachi, had turned traitor, and look, as one of the of unmistakable disgust. Mahachi began going to the house and sitting by the hearth with Akimi and her youthful mother. After three or four days of chatting and joking with them, the um, guest became one of the family. He stopped going back to the woodshed even at night and the rare times he did, he had sake on his breath and tried to entice Takazo into the house by singing the praises of the good life just a few, few wait, you're crazy, 
Takazo replied exasperation. You're gonna get us killed or at least picked up. We're lost. We're stragglers. Can't you get that through your head? We have to be careful and lie low things until things cool down. Soon he grew tired trying trying to reason with his pleasure loving friend, however, and started it instead to cut him short with curt replies. I don't like Sakai. Or sometimes I like it out here, it's cozy. But Takazo was going stir crazy too. He was bored beyond endurance and eventually showed signs of weakening. Is it really safe? he asked. This neighborhood, I mean, no signs of patrols, you sure? After being entombed of twenty days in the woodshed, he finally emerged like a half star prisoner of war. His skin had translucent waxen look of a look of death. And all above the apparent he stood beside his son and Sake Ren friend. He squinted up at the blue sky and stretching his arms broadly, yawned extravagantly. When his car cavernous mouth finally came close, one noticed that his brows had been knit all the while his face was troubled. Mahachi, he said seriously, we are imposing on these people. They're taking a big risk. To have us having us around. I think we should start for home. I guess you're right, said Mahachi. But they're not letting anyone through the barriers unchecked. The road to Ease and Kyoto are both impossible, according to the widow. She said she says that she should stay put until the snow comes. The girl says so too. She convinced we should stay hidden and you know she eats out about every day. You call sitting by the fire drinking being hidden? Sure, you know what I did? The other day, that son of Toga's men, they were still looking for Gen General Yukiri, come snooping around. I got rid of the bastards, just guy going out and greeting them. At this point, Taiko's eyes widened in disbelief. Machi let out a rolling belly laugh when to sigh that he went out. You're safer out in the open than you are crouching in the woodshed listening for footsteps and going crazy. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Mahachi doubled up with laughter again and Takazo shrugged. Maybe you're right. That could be the best way to handle things. He still has his reservations, but after this conversation he moved into the house. Oka, who obviously liked having people, more specifically men, around around made them feel completely at home. Occasionally, however, she gave him a joke by suggesting that one of them marry Akimi. They seem to be f that seems to fluster Mahachi more than Takazo, who simply ignored the suggestion and counter with a humorous remark. It was a reason for for the second franglet Matsutsu Taki, which grew at the base of the pine tree. And Takazo relaxed enough to go hunting the large mushroom on the wooded mountain just behind the house. Akimi, basket at hand, would search from tree to tree. Each time she picked up their scents, their innocent voice reverberated the woods. Takazo, over here, lots of them. Hunting around nearby, he never really replied. There's plenty, plenty over here too. Through the pine branches, the autumn sun filtered down on them in thin, slanting shafts. The carpet of pine needles and the cool shelter of the trees was soft and dusty rose, and when they try a Kimi challenge him, giggling, let us see who has the most. I do, he always replied smugly, at which point she began expecting his basket. This day was no different from the others. Ha ha, I knew it, she cried, gleefully triumphant. The, the, the way the only girls, the young could be, with no hint of self-conscious or affected modesty, she bent over his basket. You got a bunch of to toadstools in your batch. Then she discarded the poisonous fungi, one by one, not actually counting out loud, but with the movements so slow, the liver Takazo could have hardly ignored them. Even with his eyes closed, she flung each one as far as she could. Her task completed, she looked up, her young face beaming with self-satisfaction. Now look, how many more I have than you? 
It's getting late, Takazo mother. Let's go home. You're cross because you're lost, aren't you? She started racing down the mountainside like a pheasant, but suddenly stopped dead in her tracks, the expression of alarm clouding her face. Approaching dynamically across the grove, halfway down the slope, was a mountain, a man. His strides were long and languorous, and his glaring eyes were trained directly on the frail young girl before him. He looked frighteningly primitive. Everything about him smacked of a struggle to survive. He had a distinct air of hilarity, ferocious bushy eyebrows and a thick curling upper lip and a heavy sword, a cloak of mail and an animal skin wrapped around him. Akimi, he roared as he came closer to her. He grinned broadly, showing a row of yellow decaying teeth. But Akimi's face continued to register nothing but horror. Is that your wonderful mama of your home? He asked with labor sub sarcasm. Yes, Cain, a peep of replied. Well, when you go home, I want you to tell her something. Would you do that for me? He spoke mock. He spoke mock politely. Yes, his tone becomes hard. You tell her she's not putting anything over me, over on me, trying to make money behind my back. You tell her I'll be around soon for, for my cut. Have you got that? Akimi said nothing. She probably thinks thinks I don't know about it. She probably thinks I don't know about it, but the guy that she sold the goods came straight to me. I bet you were going to going to the plane too, weren't you, little one? No, of course not, she protested weakly. Well, never mind. Just tell her just tell her what I said. If she pulls away more fast ones, I'll kick her out the neighborhood. He glared at the girl for a moment and laid her off in the direction of the marsh. Takuzo, his eyes turned from the departing stranger and looked at Akimi with concern. Who who on earth was that? Akimi, her lips still trembling, answered warily. His name is... Tsuji Kazi. He comes from the village of Fua. Her voice was barely above a whisper. He's a freeboater, isn't he? Yes. Was he so worked up about? She stood there without answering. I won't tell anybody, he assured her. Can't you even tell me? Akimi, obviously miserable. Seemed to be searching for words. Suddenly, she learned against like a little chest and pleaded, Promise you, you won't tell anyone. Who am I going to tell? The Togo of Samurai? Remember that night the fir you first saw me? Of course I remember. Well, I haven't figured out yet what I was doing. No, I haven't thought about it, he said with a straight face. Well, I was ste stealing. She looked at him closely, gauging his reaction. Stealing? After a battle, I go to the battlefield and take things off the dead soldiers, swords, scoured ornaments, incest bags, anything we can sell. She look at him again with a, for a sign of disapproval, but his face betrayed none. It scares me, she sighed, then turning pragmatic, but we need the money for food. And if I say I don't want to go, mother gets furious. The sun was still fairly high in the sky. Akimi's suggestion. Takuzo sat down on the grass through the pines that they could look down on the house in the marsh. Takuzo nodded to himself as figuring something out. A bit later, he said, then the story about cutting out Morgor in the mountains big into Moksa was that a lie? Oh no, we do that too, but mother has such expensive tastes. We never be able to make a living on Moksa. When my father was alive, we lived in the biggest house in the village. In all the seven villages of Ibiki, as a matter of fact, we had a lot of servants, and mother always had beautiful things. Was your father a merchant? Oh no, he was a leader of the local free boulders. Akimi's eyes shone with pride. It was clear that she no longer feared Takazo's reaction and giving the vent her true feelings. Her jaw sat, her small hands tightening into a fist as she spoke. This Tsu Kaze Temen. The man we just met killed him. At least everyone said he did. You mean your father was murdered? Nodding silently. She began to spite of herself to weep. Takazo felt something deep in self start to thaw. Gavin felt much sympathy for the girl at first. 
though smaller than most other girls of 16. She talked like a grown woman much of the time, and every once in a while made a quick movement that put on the guard. But when the tears began to drop from her long eyelashes, he suddenly melted with pity. He wanted to hug her in his arms to protect her. All the same, she was not a girl who had anything resembling a proper upbringing. There was no nobler calling that calling then that her father seemed to be something she never questioned. Her mother had persuaded her that it was quite all right to strip the corpses, not order to eat, but in order to live nicely. Many out and out deeds would have shrunk from this task. During the long years of feudal strife, it has reached a point where all shiftless good-for-nothings in the countryside drifted into making their living this way. People had more or less come to expect it of them. When war broke out, the local military rulers even made use of their services, rewarding them generously for sending fires to the enemy's supplies, spreading false rumors, stealing horses from the enemy camps and the like. More often, their services brought, but even when they were not, a war offered a host of opportunities besides foraging among corpses for valuables. They could sometimes even rival rewards for slaying samurais whose head they merely stumbled upon and picked up. One large battle made it possible for the unscrupulous pilfers to live comfortably for six months or a year. During the most turbulent times, even the ordinary farmer and woodcutter had learned to profit from human misery and bloodshed. The fighting on the outskirts of their village might keep them keep these old souls from working, but but they have ingeniously adapted to the situation and discover how to pick over the remains of human life like furtures. Partly because of these intrusions, professional looters maintain strict surveillance over their respective territories. It was an ironclad rule that poachers, namely brigands, who trespassed on more powerful brigands' turfs, could not go unpunished. Those dare infringe on the rights of those thugs are liable to cruel retribution. Akimi shivered shiver and said, What will we do? Temin's henchmen are on their way here. I just know it. Don't worry, Takazo. Reassure her. If they do show up, I greet them personally. When the mountain came down from the mountain, when they came down from the mountain, the twilight had descended on the marsh. It was all steel. A smoke trail from bath fire at the house crept along on top of the row of tall rushes like an airborne indulgence sake. Oko, having finished applying her nightly makeup while standing idly at the back of the door. When she saw her daughter approaching side by side with Takazo, shouted, Akimi, what have you been doing out so late? There was a sternness in her eyes and voice. The girl who had been walking so Aston Lionly was brought up short. She was more sensitive to her mother's mood than to anything else in the world. Her mother had both nurtured the sensitivity and learned to exploit it, to manipulate her daughter like a puppet with a mere look or gesture. Akimi quickly fed Takuzo's side and blushing noticeably and ran ahead into the house. The next day, Akimi told her mother by Tatsu's Kaze Tama. Oko flew into a rage. Why you didn't tell me immediately? She screamed, rushing around like a mad woman, tearing her hair, taking things out the drawers, hairs, and piling them all together in the middle of the room. Malachi, Takazo, give me a hand. We have to hide everything. Malachi shifted a board, pointed out to Oko, and hosted himself up above the ceiling. There was, there was much, there wasn't much space between the ceilings and the rafters. One can barely crawl about, but it served Oka's purpose, and more li most likely that of her departed husband. Takazo standing on the stool between the mother and daughter, and began handling things at the Mahachi one by one. If Takazo hadn't heard Akimi's story the day before, he wouldn't have been amazed by the variety of articles he now saw. Takazo knew two of them had been this for a long time, but even so, it was challenging how much they accumulated. There was a dagger, 
a spear tassel, a sleeve from a suit of armor, a helmet without a crown, a miniature, a portable shrine, a Buddhist rosary, a banner staff. There was even a lacrescent saddle, beautifully carved and orally decorated with gold, silver, and mother of poor inlay. From the opening in the ceiling, Manji peered out and a perplexed look on his face. Is that everything? No. There's one more thing, said Oka, rushing off. In a moment, she was up back, bearing a four-foot sword of black oak. Takuzo started by passing out to Manji outstretched arms, but the weight of the the weight, the curve, the perfect balance of the weapon impressed him so deeply that he couldn't he could not let it go. He turned to Oka, she a sheetless look on his face. Do you think I could have this? he asked, with his eyes showing a new vulnerability. He glanced at his feet as if he knew he'd done nothing to deserve this sword. Do you really want it? she says softly, a mother tone in her voice. Yes. Yes, I really do. Although she didn't actually say he could have it. She smiled, showing a dimple. Takuzo knew the sword was his. Manachi jumped down from the ceiling, bursting with envy. He fingered the sword, covetously making Oka laugh. See how little man pouts because he didn't get a present? She tried to placate him by giving him a handsome leather purse, bead with an agate. Manachi didn't look very happy with it. His eyes kept shifting to the black oak sword. His feelings were hurt, and the purse did little to assuage his wounded pride. When her husband was alive, Oka had apparently acquired the habit of taking a leisurely steaming hot bath every morning, putting on her makeup, then drinking a bit of sake. In short, she spent the same amount of time on her toilet as the highest paid guest show. It was not the short it was not the sort of luxury that ordinary people could afford, but she insisted on it and even taught Akimi to follow the same routine. Although the girl found it boring and the reasons for it unfathomable, not only did Oka live, like to live well, she was determined to remain young forever. That evening, as she sat around recessor floor hearth, Oka, Paramaji, Sake, and tried to raise Takazo to have some as well. When he refused, she put the cup in his hand and seized him by the wrist and forced him to raise his lips. Men are supposed to be able to drink, she tried it. If you don't, if you can't do it alone, I'll help you. From time to time, Aji stared uneasily at her. Oka, conscious of his gaze, became even more familiar with Takazo, placing her hand playfully on his knees and began humming a popular love song. By this time, Ahachi had enough. Silly turned to Takazo and blurted out, We ought to be moving on soon. This had the desire to say, But, but, where would we go? Oka stammered. Back to Mini Moto. My mother's there, and so is my fiance. Militarily taken by surprise, Oka regained her composure. Her eyes narrowed to the sleep, sleeves. Her smile froze, and her face voice turned acid. Well, please accept my apologies for delaying you, for taking you in, and giving you a home. If there's a goal of ready for you, you better hurry on back. Far be it for me to keep it from he far be it from me to keep you. After receiving the Black Oak Sword, Takazo was never without it. He derive an indescribable pleasure from simply holding it. He often he squeezed, handled tightly, or run a blunt edge along his palm just to feel the perfect proportion of the curve up to the length. When he slept, he hugged it to his body. The cool touch of the wooden surface against his cheek reminding him of the floor of the dojo he practiced the sword techniques in winter. This nearly perfect instrument of both art and death reawakened him in the fighting spirits that he inherited from his father. Takazo had loved his mother, but she never left his father and moved. But she had left his father and moved away when he was so small, leaving him home with Musai, a Mark, a Martin. Who have wouldn't know how to spoil a child in an unlikely event he had wanted to. In his father's presence, 
The boy had always felt awkward and frightened, never really at ease. When he was nine years old, he craved a kind word for, from his mother that he had run away from. She had run away from home and go all the way to Harmina province where she was living. Takazo never learned why his mother and father had separated and at the age an explanation might have might not have helped much. She had married another samurai by whom she had one more child. Once a little once the little runaway has reached Harmina. He wasted no time locating his mother. On the occasion, she took him to a wooden area behind the local shrine so they wouldn't be seen, and there, with tearful eyes, hugged him tightly and tried to explain why he had to go. Go back to his father. Takuzo never forget the scene. Every detail of it remained vividly in his mind as long as he lived. Of course, Mr. Mitsusai, being the samurai he was, has sent people to retrieve his son the moment he had learned of his disappearance. It was obvious where the child had gone. Takazo had returned to Minimoto like a bundle of firewood strapped on the back of an unsaddled horse. Mitsuri, by the way of greeting, had called him an insolent brat in a state of rage, verging on hysteria, caned him until he could cane no more. Takazo remembered explicitly than anything else the vent in which his father had spat out his ultimatum. If you go to your mother one more time, I'll disown you. Not long after this incident, Takazo learned that his mother has fallen ill and died. Her death had an effect of transforming him to a quiet, gloomy child into a village bully. Even Mitsuri was intimidated eventually. Even he looked to his true treachery to the boy. The latter countered with a wooden staff. The only one who ever stood up to him was Mahachi, also the son of a samurai. And the other children all did Takazo bidding. By the time he was 12 or 13, he was almost tall as an adult. One year, a wandering samurai named Arima Kimi put a gold embracing banner and offered to take challenges from the village. Takazo killed him effortlessly. effortlessly Eliching praise from his from his valor from the villagers. Their high opinion of him, however, was short lived since he has grown older and became increasingly unmanageable and brutal. Many thought him sadistic and soon, whenever he appeared on the scene, people gave him a very wide berth. His attitude towards them grew to reflect their coldness. When his father, as harsh and unrelenting as ever, finally died, the cruel street of Takazo widened even more. Had it not been for his older sister, Ogan Takazo would probably have gotten himself into something far over his head and been driven out of the village by an angry mob. Fortunately, he loved his sister and powerless before her tears, usually did whatever she asked. Going off to war with Mahachi was a turning, for, turning point for Takazo. It indicated that somehow he wanted to take his place in society along other men. The defeat had abruptly curtailed such hopes, and found himself once again plunged into the dark reality from which he thought he had escaped. Still, he was a youth, blessed with sublime like heartedness that flourished only in the age of strife. When he slept, his face became as placid as an infant's, completely untroubled by the thoughts of the morrow. He has the share of dreams, asleep or awake but he suffered a few will disappointments. Having so little to begin with, he had little to lose. Although it was in a sense uprooted, he was unfeathered by shackles, breathing deeply and steadily, holding on his wooden sword tightly. Takazo at this moment well had been dreaming a faint smile on his lips as the vision of his gentle sister and his peaceful hometown cast it like a mountain waterfall before he for he's closed heavily lashed eyes Oko carrying a lamp slip into the room what a peaceful face she marvel marvel under her breath she reached out and lightly touched his lip with her fingers then she brew out the lamp laid beside him curtainly 
uh, cat-like. She inched closer and closer to his body, her whitened face, colorful nightgown, really too useful for her. Hidden by the darkness, the only sound that could be heard was a few dew drops dripping onto the window sill. I wonder if he's still a virgin, she amused, which tried to remove his wooden sword. The instant she tucks it, Takuzo was on the feet. Thief! Was on his feet and shouting, Thief! Thief! Okathro was thrown over onto the lamp, which cut her shoulder and chest, and Takuzo was wrenching her arm without mercy. She screamed out in pain, astonished she released her. Oh, it's you! I thought it was a thief! Ooh, ow! Moaned Oka. That hurt! I'm sorry! I didn't know it was you! You didn't know. You don't know your own strength. You almost turned my arm off. I said I was sorry. What are you doing here? Ignoring his innocent query, she quickly recovered from her arm injury and tried to pull the same limb around his neck, cooing. You don't have to apologize, Takazo. She ran back of her hand, swiftly against his cheek. Hey, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Shouting, shrinking away from her touch. Don't make so much noise, you idiot. You know how I feel about you. She went on to fondle him, with him swallowing her like a man attacked by a swarm of bees. Yes, I'm very grateful. Neither of us will ever forget how kind you have been. Take it as it all in all that. I don't mean that, Takazo. I'm talking about my woman's feelings, the lovely warm feelings I have for you. Wait a minute, he said, jumped up. I like a lamp. Oh, how can you be so cruel? She whimpered, moving to embrace him. He don't, don't do that, he cried indignantly. Stop it, I mean it. Something in his voice was something intense and resolute and frightened Oka into a halt, into halting her attack. Takazo felt his bones wobbling, his teeth rattling, never encountered such a formidable adversary. Not even when he looked up at the horses gallowing past him, has his heart pop, 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 pop him. <laughs> pumping so he sat cringing in the corner of the room go away please he pleaded go back to your own room if you don't i'll call my and i'll wake the whole house up oka did not budge she sat there in the dark breathing heavily staring at him there his eyes she wasn't about to rebuff takazo she cooed don't you understand how i feel he made no reply don't you yes but do you understand how I feel being stuck up in my sleep, frightened to death and mauled by a tiger in the dark? It was her turn to be silent. A lone whisper, almost a growl, emerged from the deep part of her throat. She said each part of her symbol with vengeance. How can you embarrass me so? I embarrass you? Yes. This is mortifying. There were both so intense they haven't noticed the knocking at the door which has apparently been going on for some time now the pounding was punctuated by shot what's going on in there are you deaf open the door the light been cracked between the sliding rain shutters and kimi already awake then Maji footsteps thudded towards them and his voice called what's going on from the hallway kimi cried alarm mother are you in there please answer me blindly Oka scrambled back into her room, just adjoining Takazo, answer him from there. The men appear outside to have, to have pried, oh, pry open the shoulders and storm into the house. When she reached the hearth room, she saw six or seven pairs of broad shoulders crowded into the adjacent dirt floor kitchen. She was a big step down with, since it was set at a lower level than the other doors. One of the men shouted, It's two his Tema, get us some light. The men barged rudely into the main part of the house. She that they didn't stop to remove this, the sandals, a sure sign of his habitual acuteness, and they began poking everywhere in the closets, in the drawers, under a thick straw, the tumi covering the floor. Tema sat himself royally by the hearth and watched his headsman systematically ransack the rooms. He thoroughly enjoyed being charged, but soon seemed to be tired of his own inactivity. This is taking too long, he growled. He pounded his fist on his tummy. You must have something here. Where is it? I don't know what you're talking about, replied Oko, following her hands over her stomach forbearingly. 
Don't give me that woman, ye bellow. Where is it? I know it's here. I go have a thing. Nothing? Nothing. Well, then maybe you don't. Maybe I have the wrong information. He eyed her worriedly, tugging and scratching his, at his beard. That's enough, man, he thundered. Oka, meanwhile, sat down on the next throne with a sliding door wide open. She had back, she had her back to him, but even so, she looked defiant as though telling him he could go ahead and search wherever he had, he had a mind to. Oka, he called gruffly. What do you want? came the icy reply. How long, uh, how about a little something to drink? Will you like the, some water? Don't push me, he warned menacingly. Ah, uh, Oka. He says, he says, softening, almost admiring her for her cold-blooded stubbornness. Don't be that way. I haven't been to a visit for a long time. Is this any way to treat an old friend? Some visit. Now it takes, now, take it easy. You're partly to blame, you know. I've been hearing about what Moksa Man's widow has been up to, up to from too many different people to think it's all lies. I hear you've been sending your lovely daughter out to rob corpses. Now she's she been doing a thing like that. Show me your proof, she shrieked. Where's the proof? It have been planted to dig out. I wouldn't have given out a Kimi advance warning. You know the rules of the game. It's my territory. I got to go through my motions of searching your house. Otherwise, everybody get the idea that they could get away with the same thing. Then where I be? I gotta protect myself, you know. She stared at him in a steely silence. Her head half turned towards him, chin and nose proudly raised. Well, I'm gonna let you off this time, but just remember, I'm being especially nice to you. Nice to me? Who? You? That's a laugh. Oka, he goes, come here and pour me a drink. When... She shows signs, no signs of moving, exploding, you crazy bitch. Can't you see that if you were nice to me, you would have had to live like this? He calmed down a bit. Then advised her, think about, it, think about it for a while. I'm overcome by your kindness, sir, came the venomous reply. You don't like me, just answer me this. Who killed my husband? Am I supposed to expect me to believe you that you don't know? If you want to take revenge on whoever it was, I'll be happy to help any way I can. Don't play dumb. What do you mean by that? You seem to hear so much from people. Haven't they told you that it was your, you yourself who killed them? Haven't you heard that Tumi's tenant was a murderer? Everyone, everyone else knows it. I may be a widow or a free boater, but I haven't sucked so low that I play around with my husband's killer. You had to go and say it didn't you? Couldn't leave it well enough alone. Will Rufo laugh. He drained the sake cup in one gulp and pour another. You know, you really, you really shouldn't say things like that. It's not good for your health or your pretty's daughter. I'll bring Akimi up properly. After she's married, I'll get back at you, mark my word. Tema laughed until his shoulder, his whole body shook like a cake on a bean curd. After he downed all the sake he could find, he motioned to one of his men who was well positioned in a corner of the kitchen, his lance propped vertically against his shoulder. You there, he boomed, push aside some of the ceiling boards with the butt of your lance. The man did as he told. As he went around the room poking at the ceiling, Oga treasure trove began falling in the flow like hailstones. Just as I expected all along, said Tema, getting clumsily to his feet. You see it, men? Evidence. She broken the rules, no question. Take her outside and give her punishment. The man converged on her hearth room, but abruptly came to a halt. Oka stood, stood proudly in the doorway, as though daring them to lay a hand on her. Tema, who stepped down to the kitchen, called her impatiently. What are you waiting for? Bring her out here. Nothing happened. Oka continued to stare the men down, and they remained as if paralyzed. Tema, to take over the clicking, clicking his tongue, made for Oka, but he, made, but he 
two stopped short in front of the doorway, standing behind Oka, not visible from the kitchen, were two fierce-looking young men. Takazo was holding the wooden sword low, posed to fracture the shins of the first, first comer and anyone else stupid enough to follow. On the other side was Mahachi, holding a sword high in the air, ready to bring it down on the first neck that ventured through the doorway. Akimi was nowhere to be seen. So that's how it is, groaned Tema. Suddenly remember the scene on the mountainside. I saw that one walking in the other day with Akimi. The one with the stick. Who's the other one? Near Mahachi and Nartakuzo said a word, making it clear they intended to answer with their weapons. The tension mounted. There aren't there aren't supposed to be any men in this house, for Tema. You too, you must be from the plain. You better watch your step. I'm warning you. Neither of, the me neither of them move a muscle. There isn't anybody in these parts who doesn't know the name of Tushi Tema. I'll show you what I show you what we do to stragglers. Silence. Tema waved his men out of the way. One of them backed straight into the hearth. In the middle of the floor, he let out a yelp and fell in, sending a shower of sparks from the spark of the burning kindling up to the ceiling. In seconds, the room filled with complete smoke. Ah! As Tema lunged into the room, Audrey brought down his sword with both hands, but the older man was too fast for him, and the blow glanced off the tip of Tema's scabbard. Oka taking refuge in the nearest corner while Takazo waited. His black oak sword horizontally posed. He aimed at Tema's legs and swung with all his strength. The staff whistled through the darkness, but there was no thud of impact. Somehow this bull of a man has jumped up just in time on the way down through him so that Takazo with the force of a boulder. Takazo felt as though he was tangling with a bear. This was the strongest man he ever fought. Tema grabbed him by the throat and landed two or three blows that made him think that his skull would have cracked. Then Takazo got his second win and sent Tema flying through the air, landing against the wall, rocking the house and everything in it. And Takazo raised his wooden sword, came down on Tema's head. The free boy rolled over and jumped to his feet and fled. With Takazo closing on his tail, Takuzo was determined not to let Tema escape. That would be dangerous. His mind was made up. When he caught him, he was not going to do a halfway job of killing him. He will make absolutely certain that a breath of life was left. That was Takuzo's nature. He was a creature of extremes. Even when he was a small child, there was not there has been something primitive in his blood, something hearkening back to the fierce warriors of ancient Japan, something as wild as it was pure. If it was neither the light of civilization, nor the tempering of knowledge, nor did it know moderation, it was a natural talent, and the one that had always prevented his father from liking the boy. Mitsuri had tried, in the official typical of the military class, to curve his ferocity by punishing him severely and often, but the effect of such discipline had been had made the boy wilder, like a wild boar whose true ferocity emerges within the prize of food. The more villagers despised the young roughneck, the more lorded it, it over them. As a child of nature became a man, he grew bored, grew bored with a swaggering bout as the village as though he owned it. It was too easy to intimidate the timid, too easy to intimidate the intel, in, timid, timid villagers. He been he began to dream of bigger things. The plain, the battlefield, have given him his first lesson what the world was really like. His youthful illusions shattered. Not only he had been many to begin with. It would never occur to him brew over having fell in the first real adventure or to amuse on the grimness of the future. He didn't know yet. He didn't know the meaning of self-discipline and he'd taken the whole bloody catastrophe in stride. And now fortunately, fortunately, he 
He stumbled onto a reality, a big fish to Zatema, the leader's freebooters. This was the kind of adversary he longed to lock horns with at the battlefield. Coward! Yelled. Stand and fight! Takazo was running like lightning through the pitch black field, shouting taunts while the wild ten paces ahead, Tenma was fleeing as if on wings. Takazo's hair was literally on the end and the wind made a groaning noise as it swept past his ears. He was made happy, happier than he ever been in his life. The more he ran, the closer he came to the sheer animal ecstasy. He leapt at Tenma's back. Blood spurred it out of the end of the wooden sword, and a blurred curling scream pierced the silent night. The freeboarder's hulking frame fell to the ground with a leading thud and rolled over. The skull was smashed to, to bits. The eyes popped out of the sockets. After two or three more heavy blows to the body, broken ribs protruded from the skin. Takazo raised his arms, wiping the river sweat from his brow. Satisfied, Captain? he asked triumphantly. Then he started nonchalantly back to the house. The observer knew on the stream might have thought of him out for an evening stroll with not a care in the world. He felt free, no remorse, knowing that the other man had won. If the other man had won, he himself be lying there, dead and alone. Out in the darkness came Bahachi. Takazo, is that you? Yeah, he replied dully. What's up? Machi ran up, announced breathlessly, I killed one, and about you? I killed one too. Machi held his sword, soaked in blood, right down to the braiding on the hilt. Squaring his shoulders with pride, he said, the other ran the way. These thieving bastards are, much, are not much as fighters, no guts. Can only stand up to corpses. Ha! Real even. A real even match, I say, ha ha ha. Both of them, stained with gore and contented as a pair as well-fed kittens. Chattering happily, they headed for the lamp visible in the distance. Takazo with his bloody stick. Machi with his bloody sword. As a stray horse struck his head, struck his head through the window and looked around the house, his story woke the two sleepers, cursing the animal. Takazo gave him a smart slap on the nose. Machi stretched and yawned, remarked, How well you slept. The sun is pretty high already, said Takazo. He supposed this afternoon it couldn't be. After a sound sleep, the events of the night before were all forgotten for these, for these two. Only today and tomorrow existed. Takazo ran out behind the house, shipped the way tripped to the waves, crouching down beside the clean, cool mountain stream. He splashed water on his face, doused his hair, washed his chest and back. Looking up, he inhaled deeply several times as though he was trying to drink the sunlight and the air in the sky. Mahachi went sleepily into the hearth room where he beat a cheery good morning to Oka and Kimi. Why are, why? Why are you two charming ladies wearing sorry, wearing sorry pussies for, are we? Yes, most defiantly. You look like you're both in mourning. What there's to be glooming about? We killed your husband's murderer and gave his henchmen a beating that they won't soon forget. Machi's dismay was not hard to fathom. He thought the widow and her daughter would be overjoyed at Tema's death, indeed the night before. Akima clapped her hands with glee she heard when she first heard about it, but Oka looked uneasy from the first and today, slouching dejectedly, by the fire, she looked even worse. What's the matter with you? He asked, thinking she was the most difficult woman in the world to please. What gratitude, he said to himself, taking the bitter tea that Akimi poured for him and scrolling down in the hunt hunches. Oka's smiled wan wanely, envying the young. Who knows? Not always a way of the world, Machi, she said wearily. You don't seem to understand. Tema had a hundred of followers. Of course he did. Crooks like him always do. We're not afraid of the kind of people who follows the likes of him. If we could kill him, why should we be afraid of his underlings? If they try to get at us, Takazo and and I will just will just do nothing in Brother Okaka. 
Machi pulled his shoulders and said, Who says so? Bring on as many of them as you like. There's nothing about a bunch of worms. Or do you think Takazo and I are cowards that we are just going to slither away on our bellies to retreat? What do you take us for? You're not cowards, but you're childish. Even to me, Tema was a younger younger brother named Tuzikomi Korhe. And if he comes after you, the two of you roll into a one wouldn't have a chance. This was the kind of talk that Mahadri liked to hear, but as she went on, he started to think that maybe she has a point. Kohei apparently had a large band of followers around Ayuzugawa and Kiso, and not only that, he was an expert in the martial arts, uh, usually a dab at catching people off guard. And so far, no one, no one Kohei had publicly announced he would kill had lived out his normal life. To Mahadri's way of thinking, it was one thing if a person attacked you in the open, it's quite another he snuck up on you when you're fast asleep. That's a weak point with me, he admitted. I sleep like a log. Damn. This book is by Buzashi by Iji Yoshikawa. It's a Japanese epic written in the early 20th century in the in, in the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War during the era of imperial Japan. 